to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco. This week, I'm going to talk about one of the most famous palaces that we think of when we imagine Henry VIII, his iconic palace along the Thames, Hampton Court, one of only two palaces remaining, in addition to St. James's Palace, that actually belong to Henry directly. So Hampton Court Palace is a royal palace in Richmond-upon-Thames, 11 and a half miles southwest of Charing Cross and upstream of central London on the River Thames. Thomas Wolsey, the Archbishop of York, chief minister and favorite of Henry VIII, who I actually had an episode about several years ago, took over the site of Hampton Court Palace in 1514. But before then, it had actually had a history as a property of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, a military order. The order acquired the manor of Hampton in 1236 and used the site as a center for agricultural estates where produce was stored and accounts were kept. Excavations and early documents suggest that the knights had a great barn or hall and a stone room that they used as an estate office. There was probably very little, if any, residential accommodation. By the 14th century, The Hampton Estates were conveniently located between a few of the royal palaces, and it was a perfect stopping off point for royal visitors. The manor underwent some construction to provide a guest house fit for royalty, and eventually the order decided to rent out Hampton, and one of the early tenants was the Lord Chamberlain to Henry VII. The area around Hampton was becoming more popular with the royal family, as Henry VII started rebuilding the royal lodgings at Sheen, as Richmond Palace. The royal family with Henry VII and his queen Elizabeth of York spent a great deal of time at Hampton Manor, enjoying it as a nice country getaway that was still quite close to London. This made the property value increase and attracted the attention of Hampton Court's next occupant, Thomas Woolsey. Cardinal Woolsey was soon to become the Lord Chancellor and his star was on the ascendant, and he needed to have a home that would be fit to entertain the king. He spent over 200,000 gold crowns on improvements so that his close friend, King Henry VIII, could come and visit and be entertained in splendor. He took what what had been a luxurious private home and turned it into a vast palace complex suitable for a bishop. He added private chambers for his own use, as well as three suites for the royal family, one for Henry, one for Catherine of Aragon, and one for their daughter, the Princess Mary. All three apartments led into a huge processional route to a double-height receiving chamber. Henry visited and stayed in the apartments immediately after they were completed in 1525. One of the best parts of Hampton Court Palace that survives is the outer courtyard that Woolsey built to house his guests. The courtyard was cobbled with a high gatehouse, and the main features of the building remain. Over 40 guest lodgings, each with an outer and inner room, and all of them with the equivalent of a modern-day ensuite bathroom, which was called a garter robe. Woolsey still lived at his home in York Palace in London, which was the official residence for the Archbishop of York, but he used Hampton Court as a country home and also for diplomatic visits. In the 1520s, Hampton Court hosted European delegations, during which time Woolsey showed off displays of his conspicuous consumption while he signed treaties. He wanted to demonstrate the glory of Henry VIII and to show that Henry's ministers knew how to live as well as any ministers in Europe. But some people saw it more as Woolsey showing off his own rise to stardom. Whatever the reasons behind it, the architecture is a rare example of a 30-year era when English architecture transitioned from domestic Tudor, strongly influenced by perpendicular Gothic, to the Italian Renaissance classical style. This blending of styles was due to a small group of Italian craftsmen who were working at the English court in the second and third decades of the 16th century. They specialized in adding Renaissance ornamentation to otherwise straightforward Gothic Tudor buildings. It was one of these, Giovanni de Mino, who was responsible for the set of eight relief busts of Roman emperors, which were set into the Tudor brickwork at Hampton Court. John Skelton, a poet and tutor to Henry VIII, wrote this poem. Why come you not to court? To which court? To the king's court or to Hampton Court? 
nay, to the king's court. The king's court should have the excellence, but Hampton Court hath the preeminence. As we discussed in an earlier episode about Thomas Wolsey, his fall came when Henry VIII wanted a divorce from Catherine of Aragon when she was unable to bear him a son and male heir. Despite Wolsey's best efforts with the Pope, Henry's divorce never materialized, and Catherine refused to give in and give Henry his divorce, despite years and years of attempts and political maneuverings. In 1528, Wolsey lost both Hampton Court and York Place to the king. Hampton Court Palace became one of the most important palaces to Henry in the second half of his, of his reign. He started remodeling when he took over the palace and finished his construction around 1540. Henry VIII's court consisted of over 1,000 people, and while the king owned over 60 houses and palaces, few of these were large enough to hold the whole assembled court, and one of the first things that the king did with his building works in order to transform Hampton Court to a principal residence was to rebuild the vast kitchens. These were quadrupled in size in 1529. At the time, Hampton Court was one of the most modern palaces in England. There were tennis courts, a bowling alley, pleasure gardens, 1,100 acres of hunting parks, 36,000 square feet of these remodeled kitchens, a chapel, a great hall dining room, and, this is the best part, a communal lavatory known as the Great House of Easement, which could sit 28 people at a time. Good times. There was also even running water through lead pipes that came from Kingston three miles away. Between 1532 and 1535, Henry also added the Great Hall, which was the last medieval Great Hall built for the English monarchy, and the Royal Tennis Courts. The Great Hall features a carved hammer beam roof, and during Tudor times, this was the most important room of the palace. Here, Henry would dine in state, seated at a table on a raised dais. The hall took five years to complete, and the king was actually so impatient for its completion that the masons were forced to work throughout the night by candlelight. The gatehouse to the second inner court was adorned in 1540 with the Hampton Court astronomical clock, and an early example of a pre-Copernican astronomical clock. It still functions, and the clock shows the time of day, the phases of the moon, the month, the quarter of the year, the date, the sun and star sign, and the high water at London Bridge. And of course, this latter information was really important to people visiting because it was along the Thames, and the preferred method of transport at the time was by barge, and low water at London Bridge would create dangerous rapids. The gatehouse is also known today as Anne Boleyn's Gate after Henry's second wife. Work was still underway on Anne Boleyn's apartments above the gate when the king executed her. Speaking of wives, each of Henry's six wives spent time at the palace, and most had new lodgings built. Henry built, rebuilt his own rooms at least six times. The king's children and courtiers, visitors, and servants also had rooms at the palace. As with Cardinal Wolsey, Henry used Hampton Court as a way to impress foreign visitors. Most famously, Henry entertained the French ambassador in 1546, along with his own entourage of 200 gentlemen and 1,300 mem members of his own court for six days. Gold and velvet tents surrounded the palace for the occasion. During the Tudor period, the palace was the scene of many historic events. In 1537, the king's much-desired male heir, the future Edward VI, was born at the palace, and his mother, Jane Seymour, died there two weeks later. Four years afterwards, while attending mass in the palace's chapel, the king was informed of his fifth wife's adultery. The queen, Catherine Howard, was then confined to her room in Hampton Court Palace for a few days before being sent on to Sion House and then the Tower of London. Legend claims that she briefly escaped her guards and ran through the haunted gallery to beg Henry for her life, but she was recaptured. After Henry died, the palace was still used as his children spent a lot of time there. Edward had actually been christened in the Chapel Royal in 1537, and Mary spent her honeymoon at Hampton Court in 1554. Each of his children used Hampton Court as a country retreat away from central London and the royal palaces there like Whitehall or St. James's. 
Neither Edward or Mary added much in the way of construction to Hampton Court or any of Henry's palaces. He had left over 60 houses in really good quality, and it took a great deal of effort to keep them all operating, much less add to them. Queen Elizabeth visited Hampton Court a lot, but she also built just a little. She did add a new kitchen called the Queen's Privy Kitchen, which is now a coffee shop. She also added a bay window that was inscribed in 1568 and can still be seen. And even with little addition to it, Hampton Court remained one of the finest palaces in England. The Duke of Württemberg visited in 1592 and called it the most splendid and magnificent royal edifice to be found in England or, for that matter, in other countries. And, of course, this was 50 years after Henry was doing all of his building. During Elizabeth's reign, Hampton Court was still used as an arts venue for court entertainments and also to welcome foreign delegations. Later generations of monarchs would also use Hampton Court Palace as a getaway, a palace to welcome foreign visitors, and as a hunting lodge. Shakespeare actually performed plays there under James I, and later Charles I was held as a prisoner at Hampton Court during the English Civil War. Oliver Cromwell would spend time there, and his daughter was married in the Chapel Royal. And later in the 17th and 18th century, more construction was completed, and the famous Christopher Wren built an entire section of the palace for William and Mary. More recently, it was also used in the Summer Olympics of 2012 as a venue for the road cycling time trials. So that's it for this week, except the book recommendation, which is Susanna Lipscomb's A Journey Through Tudor England, Hampton Court Palace, and the Tower of London to Stratford-upon-Avon and Thornbury Castle. I also recommend a video that's available on Amazon Prime if you have that, and I think you can also Netflix it. It's called Secrets of Iconish, Iconic British Estates, and Season 1 features Hampton Court Palace. I'll put links up on the blog. You can also visit the blog to send me comments, story ideas, or other general thoughts. And I'm adding some photos of Hampton Court. The address is http colon slash slash englandcast.com. That's englandcast.com. Or you can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash englandcast. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll be back next time with a history of some of the famous colleges and universities that were founded by the Tudors. Thanks for listening. Blow, northern wind, a sandful baby sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoort a board in Bauerbrick, that soul is Sam Lee's on sick. Men's cool maiden of me, fair and freight of thunder. In all this war, flesh of one, a board of blood and of bone, never yet in Uston on, not so merry in London.